Hey students, welcome to week four, lecture two. We're talking about consumer behavior. So this second lecture is gonna talk about decision making, the steps that we go through to rationalize our purchases. And I'm gonna focus in on three types of decision making, cognitive, habitual, and effective. And your learning objectives are listed here. And my goal for you out of finishing this lecture is to understand these different categories, what's cognitive decision making, what's habitual, and what's effective. So the first one we want to talk about is cognitive. So cognitive decision making when you're purchasing products or services means that you're simply your thought process whether uh, it's actual or not, is you believe that you're making some type of analysis, some type of rational uh, decision making in the process for making a purchase. And there's a sequence to your rational decision making. We're going to focus on this one first. Another factor that drives uh, a cognitive decision-making process for purchasing products is the amount of risk in purchasing that product. So when there is more risk, we want more information, we do a more extensive search, and we're in a cognitive decision-making process. So think about what types of risky products have you considered lately? And did you do a fair amount of research and were you in a cognitive decision-making process to purchase that product? So take a minute to review this slide and it gives you product examples for each of the different types of risks. As marketers, it's important to know what type of risks are associated with the purchase of our products. Take a minute to review this slide on your own. This slide gives an ad example of a deodorant company uh, appealing to social risk, but think about it for yourself. What types of risky products have you considered lately? And what types of risks came up for you as you were cognitively evaluating that purchase? So take a minute and reflect on that. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the five stages of the cognitive decision-making process for purchasing. First up, we have problem recognition. I have an unmet need. I need to purchase something to solve this problem. That's step one. Step two is I need to get some information. So online searches uh, to get some information about what's out there to possibly solve this problem. Step three is evaluation of alternatives. Now that I've got some information, I see some different choices here and uh, which one am I gonna buy? Step four is you actually make a choice on a purchase product. And the step five is the actual outcome. So even after the purchase, we are still cognitively evaluating our purchase. So I'm gonna elaborate on each of these stages in the following slides. So in the first step, the problem recognition step, uh, the reason we have a problem in the first place is because there's a gap between um, our actual state, where we're at, and the state that we want to be at. And I think I mentioned this in the prior lecture that the bigger the gap, the more the drive to solve the problem, right? So we have um, a need recognition when there's a gap between our um, ideal state and our actual state. That's a problem. Or we see an opportunity for things to get better. Um, but bottom line is, when there's a gap between our current state, our actual state, and the ideal state that we want to be at, then we have a problem recognition stage. That's step one. Then we get into information search, step two. And in our information search, this is where we're going to survey the environment and get the appropriate data, make a reasonable decision, and now there's so many cyber mediaries. By that I mean places like Amazon, 
where they give you all this information, even Google, and they give you uh, all these comparison products or similar products. People also purchased, and you have customer views. It's all there available to you. So we are in the information age. This step is now very easy. So the next step is we get to evaluation of alternatives. This is an interesting and important step because now the customer has gotten down to their short list of the actual alternatives that they're considering for purchase. So as marketers, we want to make sure that we make it to stage three. And I have some strategies in the next slide that's going to explain how to do that. So when we think of stage three, evaluation of alternatives, there's two concepts that apply here, evoke set and consideration set. Let me explain evoke set first. Evoke set is simply all of the products that the consumer is aware of. And they can be aware of those products through advertising or through their information search, but evoke set can be very nuanced because you want to consider, as I have in my uh, notes on this slide here, what drives getting your product into the consumer's evoke set. And oftentimes it's what is the product category. So for example, if you're looking for seasonings for food, when you think of seasonings for food, you may not be thinking of lemons as part of the evoke set for food seasonings. You're going to be thinking of salt and pepper and uh, paprika, all the other uh, uh, seasonings that are out there. So here's uh, Sunkiss Lemons, and they're trying to make uh, lemons be part of the Evoke set. So um, you'll see in my notes on this slide here that when you have a new product, a new product category, like uh, uh, driverless cars, consumers have to take that new product category and put it to, into an existing evoke set, into an existing product category to be able to evaluate it against other choices. So as marketers, we want to help influence how the consumer puts our new product into a product category. Is a driverless car going to go in a product category with other existing cars or is it going to go into a different category of transportation because a driverless car you're not really driving the car so it could be in a product category in evoke set that compares with public transportation so and you see some other examples on the slide here like where do you put hemp clothing is it in clothing or are some people putting it into an evoke set of weed oh it's like marijuana clothes Hi, I want to expand on consideration set. So I'm jumping here with just my audio voice. So whereas evoke set is the full category of products that we're aware of, the consideration set is the short list that we're actually as a consumer evaluating for potential purchase. It's our short list. And as marketers, we want to make sure that we do end up on that consideration set. So evoke set, all that we're aware of in a category, consideration set, the ones that we're actually considering purchasing from. So when we know what evoke set our product is in and what product category our product is in and who we're being compared against, then that helps us as marketers to figure out how to position that product. Do we want to position it in the existing Evoke set with existing products in that category? Or do we want to try to go into a different product category? Another interesting factor about cognitive decision making when purchasing products is that we go through these mental biases. And uh, those are influenced through this mental accounting that we do by framing a problem in terms of uh, what are our gains and what are our potential losses in making our decisions? So uh, you can see some sub examples here. So, you know, if we bought something, we're reluctant to waste it because we already paid for it. So it's like shopping for food and then feeling bad about throwing stuff out because we already paid for it. So 
this product's past the expiration date, but I'm going to use it because I have this sunk cost fallacy that I don't want to waste something that we've paid for, right? So you can read some of these other examples as well and see if you've done them. Okay, so to sum it all up, for the cognitive purchasing process, these decisions are the outcome of a series of stages, problem recognition, information search, evaluation of alternatives, purchase, post-purchase uh, evaluation that results in the selection of one product over competing options. And we as marketers can influence those different stages of the cognitive process. So that's cognitive purchasing. But there's other ways that we purchase products as well. It's not always a cognitive, deliberate, rational, sequential process. It could be habitual or it can be even effective. So let's talk about habitual purchases, which are more automatic and somewhat unconscious in our purchasing patterns. When we talk about habitual purchases, what we're referring to here is that we often use these kind of mental shortcuts what are called heuristics and you can click on the yellow link there to get a definition um, and this ad with that's all pink is how a young girl here and planning her birthday party just used the heuristics of make everything pink for my birthday party I don't want to think about it and in the information age that we're in nowadays we are all bombarded with so much information that as consumers, we actually value when brands can give us some heuristics to make some shortcuts and simplify the decision-making process. We don't always want to go through an exhaustive decision-making process to purchase a product. So uh, let's look at some of the common ways that we use shortcuts, heuristics, to purchase products. These are the four most common heuristics that are used by consumers. Covariation, country of origin, familiar brands, and higher prices. Let me explain each of these. Covariation is that we look for some type of signal or cue that it's a quality product or that it's a good purchase. For example, when we're buying a car, uh, if the car is clean and shiny, we believe that it's in better condition just by the fact that it looks really clean. So car dealers know this. And if you've ever sold a car on Craigslist, you probably know this. But that's where we use a shortcut. Or perhaps it's you're going out on a first date and the date shows up and they're dressed really sloppy and messy. So you're already going to have some judgments that that date is perhaps low quality versus if somebody shows up and they're dressed very nicely um, you're gonna make judgments that that date is of a higher quality they could be a terrible person with poor character um, and the other person who's dressed sloppily might have excellent character and be a very nice person and a good partner but you don't know that um, because you're using those those uh, co-variation shortcuts of uh, appearance to kind of help make that decision so covariation, which is just uh, kind of looking for just how it looks. The packaging looks good, or it's shiny packaging, or that's a cool package. Let's just buy that one, or I like the color. Uh, that's covariation. Country of origin is, wow, it's a watch. It's from Switzerland. It must be good. Or I need to buy a fine bottle of wine. This one's from France. France makes really good wine. Uh, therefore, it must be good. So some countries come with uh, an impression of quality already built in. So that's country of origin. The third is familiar brand names. So maybe you're buying a new product. And you're like, I don't know. I haven't really bought this thing before. Uh, you know, I've bought uh, Coleman tents and other stuff. So um, I'm going to try this new um, Coleman backpack because the other stuff that they make is all of high quality. Uh, or like Patagonia if you're into outdoor equipment. All their stuff's really good, high quality, right? So um, I'm going to use a familiar brand name uh, when I'm unsure. I'm going to use that kind of shortcut. And then the last uh, heuristic, believe it or not, is higher prices. Sometimes when you're not sure, you know, I'm not sure which one's good quality. 
let's buy the most expensive one. It's more expensive, therefore it must be better, uh, is part of the thought process there. So all of these are heuristics that we use, uh, shortcuts for habitual purchase. Let's just kind of make it habitual. I don't want to think about it too much, right? Habitual. So the third way we buy products is through an effective process. Even though we don't like to admit it, I'm sure we can all agree that there's times when we just buy things because it's an emotional or irrational purchase. So we make these decisions based on a non-rational process. It's an impulse buy or it's just retail therapy. I needed to go out and shop and buy some stuff to feel better, right? So for me, it's I'm in the checkout stand and I've got my healthy food and I'm using my budget for my groceries. And then I come eye to eye with the jumbo sized dark chocolate Reese's peanut butter cups and my will power just melts away and it ends up in my cart, right? So that's an effective decision process. So in summary, there's three ways that we purchase products. The majority of products, especially if they have risk or if we're highly involved with the products, we're going to use a cognitive decision making process and we're going to move through those five steps of the decision making process to make those decisions. At other times, however, we use a habitual process and we use some shortcuts to do that. And the third process is sometimes we just use an effective, emotional, irrational process behind purchasing products. And marketers can be involved in each of those processes. And we want to understand which type of product and what type of decision process for our product our consumer is going to go through and how can we influence those decisions accordingly. All right. Thanks for listening. You've got your homework listed up here. Good luck with the homework and thanks for listening to this lecture. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.